You're listening to a mighty fortress. Welcome to Mighty Fortress. I am your host, Night Jake. Over these few weeks, we're going to be going through a presentation that John Mackay gave at the St. Paul's Lutheran Church in Handorf. Now, this talk was organised by Pastor Bob Seidel on behalf of the St. Matthew's Independent Lutheran Church in Handorf, but they met together at St. Paul's Lutheran Church. Here, John Mackay gave a presentation regarding the six days of creation. Now I've recorded this entire talk and I've broken it up into three parts and over these three episodes we will be listening to this talk in its entirety. Uh, the sound quality is not the best so bear with me but I hope you enjoy the talk. It's well worth listening to. Well, good evening everybody and thank you all for coming. A warm welcome to you all here this evening for any or all, any of you who don't know me, I'm Pastor Bob Sile, from St. Matthews here in Harnwolf, and um, uh, we're pleased tonight to have John Mackay to uh, give us a presentation here. We a uh, fairly hot topic um, in the church today is did God use evolution to create the world or did he actually Created in six days, as I believe Scripture firmly says, um, and there's a lot of implications in this whole thing for Christian, for the Christian faith, ultimately. And uh, I feel that this is very, a very important issue. So um, we've got to have John speak to us tonight, and then uh, following the presentation. Um, uh, we will have a time of questions and after that we will have a tea of coffee and some uh, light refreshments here as well. And uh, I'll, I'll, I'll be sure that you will have a retiring offering for John just to help him to cover his expenses to uh, The lose, if anyone needs them, you go through that door, continue on about 15 metres and then there's a hallway to the right and the bus Seven minutes. Well, you'll find it anyway. You know where it is. The second door on the right. Yeah. Sorry. Oh, yeah, that's right. Well, you, you can see the kitchen is not. That's right, yeah. Go in there. I'm sure you'll work it out. Okay. Um, I'd like to begin with Lord Jesus, thank you for your wonderful word, which is the power and the truth in this world. We know that this world came into being, not only this world, but the whole universe, and all that is in it came into being through you speaking your word. And God said, as you repeat there in Genesis chapter 1, we see sadly in Genesis chapter 3, that Satan managed to sow the seed of doubt into the heart of Eve in questioning, did God really say? And we know that the old devil is still up to his tricks, the same old tricks still today. And so, be with us all here tonight. Help us to see that your word is the truth, that what you say stands forever, even though heaven and earth will pass away. Thank you for the great comfort you give us in the gospel of your Son and our Saviour, Jesus Christ, which also depends absolutely on the truth of your word. Be with us tonight, Lord, and bless us here, and bless God as well. Amen. Thank you, Bob. Bob's a pretty hard taskmaster. Is this on? Yes, that's on. Can you hear me? Yes. Oh, great. Bob's a hard taskmaster. We started out this morning by uh, wandering through a muddy quarry to get ready for a field trip this afternoon. And after a sandwich, we wandered again through that muddy quarry 
many times accompanied by, well I think in the end they were mud covered children weren't they? <laughs> and, and a few mud covered adults and then we did a podcast and then we came down here and now you're about to enjoy a, a wonderful evening and I'm going to enjoy your company as well. Um, Bob has asked me not directly to deal with that subject but it's relevant to what we are going to be doing. Bob asked me, could we deal with, is Genesis literal? Or could it be symbols of evolution, right? So I'm going to try and tackle just Genesis 1 to 11. Summary, creation, the fall of man, Noah's flood, the Tower of Babel. Now, if you read your Bible, you'll find that that period covers several thousand years. And Bob says, I have to be done by 9 o'clock. Uh, so I can't get through everything in detail, but there's a couple of bits that if you want to ask questions on, there'll be several opportunities that you can. And often the question times are more beneficial than the lecture will necessarily be, which is designed to stimulate you. Um, I am going to touch on the subject of the age of things, because I'll be honest, many Christians who say, well, you can't believe the days are real days, or you can't believe in a worldwide flood, their logic is they think the scientist has proved things are old or the geologists have proved evolution and so they are trying to rationalize Genesis into the view they think really is the truth. Um, this issue is about what is the truth. So I'm going to tackle that issue first. Um, meanwhile, we'll bring you a commercial because I'm in charge. Um, there's free things up the back there. If you want to get our newsletter from Creation Research, there's our latest Creation News. It's almost out of date because next one comes out in two weeks. But you get to read some of the things we do. If you want that, it's free. Fill in the form and give it back before you leave. Uh, there's some things up there that are not so free that are related to tonight's subject, so I will tell you about them. Dr. Werner Gitt wrote a brilliant book on did God use evolution? So that's the essence of where uh, Bob wants to get to tonight. So if you want to follow up the whole subject, Dr. Werner Gitt's book is a brilliant look at that subject. At the uh, other end, you've got Henry Morris saying, if we take the Bible seriously, Henry was the guy who founded the Institute of Creation Research in the USA, previously a lecturer in hydrodynamics at a university, hence his first book was on Noah's flood. That's a look at all the references to creation in the Old Testament, New Testament and associated things like the flood and the fall uh, and that's a, a really interesting Bible study. So you've got it from the theistic evolution or the straight creation end. So have a look at those and as I said they're not so free and if you didn't bring your credit card Bob brought his so he's a very generous <laughs> man but if he won't help you then you can still use your own or use cash up at the back there. You will see we have a website, creationresearch.net, and uh, this subject um, has perhaps a bigger percentage of questions than all the other subjects uh, have. So if you want to know about the six days of theistic evolution, just press the Q&A button, insert the question or the subject you want, and you'll see all the things that have been organised there. You're in Australia, correct? You're in South Australia, correct? And you may not know that we have an Australian Creation Museum. Um, yep, we do. It's in Queensland. And we call it Jurassic Ark. Interesting. Oh, Jurassic Park was the movie, wasn't it? Yes. In, in fact, uh, we didn't borrow it from Steven Spielberg because he forgot to mention one thing. You see, when I say Jurassic, don't most people think dinosaurs and millions of years? Do you know what they should think? they should think of the Jura Mountains in southern Germany because a Christian creationist who believed the world was made in six days, who actually believed in Noah's flood, he was a famous geographer by the name of Alexander von Humboldt. You might have heard of him if you've studied the Humboldt current. He sailed all around the planet quite a many times. But his problem was, if I see rocks in America that look like the rocks in southern Germany, what do I call them? So he came up with the concept Jurassic, like the rocks in the Jura. Yet you and I think millions of years. No, he was thinking places. You and I think evolution. No, he was thinking locations. Hmm. Oh, at Jurassic Ark near Gympie, people come and they really dig it. Quite literally. 
we have lots of fossil trees and uh, it's a fabulous dig site to bring your family to. Suits all ages. Oh, you know how the Bible teaches man was made out of the dirt? I think the evidence is little boys love to play in it, don't they? Uh, you can ponder things like that. We take school groups there. We have a complete botanic gardens, including a whole section on how thorns develop. Hmm. Did God create thorns or did he just leave the universe alone and thorns came into existence because he cursed the ground? We have whole gardens that deal with this, but I'm not going to touch on those things tonight. You can go to our website and click on museums and go for a look yourself. We have our annual open day next Saturday, so if you're up in Queensland, it's free to get in that day and you get a lovely barbecue as well. But look, I'm going to talk about the research. Jurassic Ark Australia. You're saying, what is that? Well, no, it's not a giraffe drinking trough. That's what people have thought. What it is, is the world's first stalactite machine. Yeah? By the way, there's not much of a market for stalactite machines, trust me. I don't think we're going to get rich making stalactite machines. Um, why are we doing this? What is it? Oh, here's one of our workers. You can see we've got a half concrete pipe and he's filled it full of uh, shells. And on top of that, he's going to lay a layer of raw cement and then we're putting mulch on the top. And the whole aim is to end up with a cross section like that, mulch, cement, seashell, <coughs> and hopefully stalactites. You say, why would you even do that? Well, you see, I graduated in geology, used to lecture in geology, and I still remember a contradiction from my whole history that was irresolvable at the time. Um, I come from a generation where there wasn't water on to every house, and some of you remember that too. And so we had a big tank out the back. And those old galvanized iron tanks didn't last forever, and after a while, they developed leaks. And so what you'd do, you'd get inside and you'd cement the whole of the inside of the tank. And that actually didn't stop it, it just slowed it down. And out the side of the crack in the tank would come a white strip. And then under the tank stand would grow a stalactite. I know, I saw it with this eye and this eye. Then I finished in university, I graduated in geology, and lectured in geology and struggled with the fact that they said, don't touch the stalactites in the caves, they take so long to grow. Hmm. They didn't on my father's tank. Why do they take a long time in the caves? Uh, by the way, have a look at these stalactites. Because these are the ones that have been growing on our stalactite machine. And you say, when did that start? October 2015. These are not even a year old. And it's been interesting to have the skeptics criticise this because we call ourselves creation research because quite a few of us do the research. You see, the Bible's an interesting book. It tells you to test everything and only keep the things that are true. <laughs> Paul wrote that to the church of Thessalonica. It also tells you to have a reason for what you believe. Do you realise that Christianity is the only fact-based faith on the planet? I mean, I travel all over the globe, and if you go to India, you'll see holy men sitting in the ground covered with dust and ashes and they've got their eyes shut and they're going, um, um, um. And they think that cow over there is great grandma recycled 37 times. <laughs> I'm not trying to be sarcastic. That is what they think. And you end up with an India which many people are dying from hunger. And yet there's no food shortage in India. There's just a religion that says don't eat cows. It's interesting. Religion and consequence are never separate. So the Indians don't do experiments. They don't ask a, a reason that you need to have for what you're doing. But the Bible demands you have a reason for what you believe. Okay, there's a young geologist, Liam. He works with us, became a believer in the scriptures because of what we do. And uh, of course, the skeptics have been very negative and said, oh, these are not real stalactites. They're grown so quickly because they're only made of cement. Hmm, how would you test what it was made of? Because the ones in the cave are made of calcium carbonate, limestone, calcite. Easy test. What you do is you get your old murine eyedropper, you fill it full of 3% hydrochloric acid, and when you put it on anything, if it's made of calcite, it froths. See the bubbles? Beyond a shadow of a doubt, that's made of calcite. In fact, you know what we've been doing all this last year? I took the photo on the left on the 15th of February. 
I took the photo on the right on the 31st of March. Do you realise we can actually measure how fast these are growing? One centimetre per month. And the funny thing is, the sceptics say, oh, stalactites grow so slowly. Don't touch them in the caves, you'll ruin them for hundreds of thousands of years. Well, look, by the time we come to the 2nd of June, they were still growing. You see, this experiment's got a very, very simple point. Um, do you realise that the best lies are mostly the truth? And it's easy to accept a good lie. Good lie, that's perhaps not the best way to put it. It's easier to accept a credible lie because unless you spot the bit that's wrong, you'll fall for it. In fact, there's warning after warning in the Bible about beware of the subtlety with which Satan deceived Eve. Now, I went and actually did three years of organic chemistry as well as geology because I wanted to understand how chemicals, particularly organic chemicals, worked. We geologists dig up dead things. I wanted to understand living things. And do you know why we think the stalactites take so long to grow in caves? Because limestone dissolves very slowly in water. And even if you pump CO2 into the water, it's still not the world's fastest dissolver. And if you think that's what's involved, no wonder you think the limestone takes hundreds of thousands of years, first of all, to dissolve to make a cave, and it takes even longer to grow stalactites. Funny thing is, that's not happening on our stalactite machine because we've just demonstrated one thing. Stalactites don't grow because of the time. They grow because of a process. Do you know uh, what we're working with? One of our guys has got his doctorate in bacteriology. Um, Some of you are suffering from one simple principle. There's bacteria in your body and they deposit lime. Ah, brings a brings a bit of an awakening. You've got lime deposits where you don't want them. And we know bacteria do that. You know what we're discovering? The bacteria are actually involved in depositing lime in making stalactites. In fact, you know what else we do? Because we've got a wicked sense of humour. I borrowed my wife's ball of wool earlier this year. I thought, wonder what'll happen if we put this underneath a dripping stalactite. Well, there's our curator of Jurassic Art holding the results three months later. Get you up close. It's rock solid. What sort of rock is it? Because this is a a, a solid ball of wool now. Um, Drip acid on it. It froths. This is a ball of wool that's now calcite. Calcium carbonate. Limestone. But it gets even more bizarre. Don't go away because there's Daryl with our import from China of a bag full of woolen teddy bears. Ah, there's a young girl from a high school class putting the first teddy bear under a dripping stalactite. Two weeks later, oh, we've shifted the ball of wool and there's the teddy bear. Not just frightened, petrified. (laughs) Now, do you realise one thing? If you have the wrong process, don't be surprised it will take you an awful long time. If any of you have tried to build a jet airliner and you haven't got a clue what you're doing, it will take you a long time. Because if you had the right process, you'd get the thing done a whole lot quicker. Hmm. We live in a world which makes time the hero of the plot. Whereas in reality, if you've got the right process, you can actually achieve it a whole lot quicker. If you just pick chemicals, I'm not surprised you think they take a long time to grow. And then you ignore the fact that when you go to Janolan Caves, there are stalactites growing off the electric light wires. They really are. Go and check yourself. And then be bold enough to put your hand up and say, excuse me, sir, if these caves and stalactites take so long to grow, how long have you had electricity on here? (laughs) Yeah, they don't appreciate your humour sometimes. But actually, I stopped doing that in the caves because you know what I discovered? Most of those guides are university students earning money and they're paid to say what they're told to say. They don't know what the information is at all. They think time is all you need. In reality, you need the right process. Or the importance of this, I'll tell you what, meet this guy here. Um, He was brought up in Russia, actually in the Ukraine, under communist domination. And uh, you'll see he's got a nice smile. And he came up to me and in his broken English, 
He said, two years ago, I'm not a Christian. And then he proceeded to tell me, two years ago, I could not believe Bible. A world too old. Fossils. Millions of years. Caves. As he said in his broken English. And I said, well, why are you here then? Oh, two years ago, somebody gave me your DVD, Time Up Darwin. Yeah. And he said, all my objection, I fly away. Now I Christian, two years. It's wonderful. By the way, have you ever noticed some of these Europeans can get really enthusiastic? Yeah. But I just don't believe people enthusiasm. I went and checked with his pastor and I said, okay, this guy says A, B and C. What do you know about him? He says, well, every Saturday he's out witnessing to atheists and Jews. Because you see, he was brought up as a Jew, an unbelieving Jew, and he was an atheist. Now he's been saved. He's a Christian. Oh, why is he a Christian? Because he couldn't believe Genesis because the communists started there. Genesis is not real history. So there is no God who created. So it was a real stumbling block for him. When he found out he'd been lied to about Genesis and everything else, boy, it was easy for him to become a Christian. Hmm. Uh, you want to keep up with what we do? We even publish Instagram every week or so. For those of you who don't know what that word means, it probably means you're over 55. Don't worry about it. Uh, it's one of these <coughs> fancy new things that's really neat way of sharing some of our results. And you can sign up for it. It's free. Uh, and you will enjoy Instagram. So kids and young people, go to creationresearch.net, click on the Instagram icon, and it will put you in there. If you want to keep up with us, fill in the form up the back and give it back. And if you are interested in the research we do, we certainly do need supporters. It is not cheap. It is actually uh, rather expensive to construct these things. And we now have three of them going and uh, three lots of research projects. You might want to ask about some of them. There's some of the books up the back you'll find really helpful. Um, by the way, the piles of things that are only tiny uh, represent the, the really the ones that have been really popular in this last week or so. Vance Nelson, who's a, a guy with a science degree as well as a theology degree, <clears throat> he became a Christian out of a drug addicted background and uh, he contacted me and said, what can I do? Because I'm a theological college and I've got a problem. I'm the only one with a science degree, but I'm the only one who believes Genesis is true. I thought that was interesting. I said, well listen, don't just believe it because I say so. Don't just believe it because you read it in the book. Go out, find out about dinosaurs yourself, photograph them, dig them up, and write a book with all the pictures in, not just your opinions. So if you want the best book ever on dinosaurs, oh, by the way, dragons is what we used to call them. Dragons is what the Chinese still call them. Have a look. What he's done is get all the dragons from history and all the dinosaurs and match them up. You'll be amazed at the results. Okay, so that's an introduction. Now, at the end of this next little bit, I'm going to give you a first chance to ask me some questions. And then we'll have part two, which is sort of a real interesting Bible study, really. Um, for the record, today is what? Monday. Yeah. Do you like Mondays? Oh, sometimes. Sometimes, yeah, I tell you what. Um, I was glad today it didn't rain. We were cold and we were windy, but it didn't rain. That was lovely. Last Monday I went out to prepare another field trip and the weather changed in the middle of the day. It was miserable. And then Tuesday we called the field trip off. I've got a cough and a cold as a result. Um, okay, when I first prepared this section here, it was actually in July, early this year. I was giving a message on Sunday the 30th of July. So we'll just assume for our argument's sake, because when I'm at Bob's place, he doesn't have Wi-Fi on, and, and I couldn't actually update this on a Jewish calendar. That's what I needed to do. But on Sunday the 30th of July 2016, um, it was actually AD 2016. You do remember what the AD stands for? After the birth of who? Christ. It's not 2016 in Iraq, because you see they have a Muslim calendar. And the Muslim calendar starts from Muhammad. So it's a different year. Calendars actually are reflections of what you think are important in history. So that's our calendar, Sunday the 30th of July, AD 2016. And yet on that day, you look up the Jewish chronology and it was the 25th, 5th, 24th of Tammuz, 5776. And you say, what's the 5776? I'll help you. When you have a look at this, 
you will find you find out what the Jews think about the age of the planet. I picked up a Torah. Torah, that's the Jewish collection of the first five books of the Old Testament. And it had a convenient introduction in by Rabbi Mariner, who announced that he had written this in Adar 5756. You see, I'd just been giving a lecture at the university in uh, Washington, <coughs> excuse me, in Sacramento, a Berkeley University. It was one of the most savage meetings I'd ever had. I mean, it was packed. Berkeley, remember the university with a reputation for drugs? It's still bad. Um, on this side, there were the atheists. <coughs> on that side, there were agnostics. In the middle was the skeptics. And way up the back was half a dozen Christians. And uh, everybody down the front was there to kill me. But I went to the bookshop, picked up Rabbi Mariner's Torah with the introduction dated AD 5756, and he explained that he'd written this in what the Christians called 1996. But you see, putting all the information in, 1996 is just not 1996. It's 1996 with reference to the birth of who? <coughs> Jesus Christ. And 5756 is not just 5756. It's 5756 with reference to the creation. Ah. You see, what's interesting, when you ask a Orthodox Jew how old the planet is, he'll tell you it's less than 6,000 years old. Don't take my word for it. Go and, and, and Google Jewish Chronicle. Well, not you. Your Google is off. It doesn't work today, does it? Um, pray for more money for this guy so he can have Wi-Fi next time I come down <laughs> and update all of this. So don't be surprised. One of the things that we get over and over again is questions about this. Because many people think, how could you believe the world is less than 6,000 or 7,000 or 8,000 years old when the scientists say? There's some of the question. Did Jesus believe in six-day creation because he was just a man? And he was ignorant of modern science. How about John Lennox? What do you think of him? Because he says, oh, creation is true, but it took millions of years and really God used evolution in the end is what his opinion works out at. Okay, let's talk a bit about these things before we give you a first chance to ask some questions. Um, do you recognise John's Gospel, Chapter 1? It's in the New Testament. What's interesting about the New Testament is that it re reiterates what's in Genesis. Genesis 1, in the beginning. John 1, in the beginning. Genesis 1, in the beginning, God. John 1, in the beginning was the Word. Have you noticed a parallel yet? In the beginning, God created. <clears throat> in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Whew! Do you realize the first five words in Genesis have taken you 10 or 11 words to get to in Greek? This is a paraphrase of Genesis chapter 1. The same was in the beginning with God. Ah, oh, all things are made by him. In the beginning, God created. Four words. Look how, how much it takes to say the same thing in the New Testament where it's being said backwards and forwards, upside down, inside out. You can't miss it. And without him, not anything was made that was made. Who's the him? And the word was made flesh and dwelt among us. There's no doubt about it. When you read your New Testament, if you want to say Genesis creation is irrelevant, you strike a major problem. Your New Testament tells you Jesus Christ is God the Creator. Oh, and we could launch out on the Trinity and all sorts of other doctrines at the moment, but we won't. We've only got an hour and a bit. Um, Jesus is God the Creator. Interesting. Makes you wonder about some of the things in the Nicene Creed, doesn't it? We believe in God the Father, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ. But well, Jesus Christ is God the Creator. Or oh, isn't the Trinity an interesting mystery? Don't try and solve it for everybody, you won't. Uh, if you were, you would be God, and, and you're not, so don't pretend. Um, here's the real issue. I'm going to finish this bit by giving you a challenge to think, because this issue is actually related to who Jesus is. Because your New Testament teaches that all things are made by him, Without him, there was nothing made that was made. And when he came to earth, yes, he humbled himself, and he only ever did what his father gave him to do. But let's have a look. He turned water into? <coughs> you tried doing that lately? <laughs> I mean, if the winemakers around here could catch Jesus' recipe, they'd save themselves an awful lot of labor. They'd cut their cost to the bone. But we can't do that. Have well, you ever wondered how you do that? 
H2O is water, wine, at least C2H5OH, H is hydrogen, O is oxygen, C is carbon. Do you realise water doesn't have any carbon in it? Question, did Jesus spit into this water? No, he just spoke to it. In the beginning was the word. Ah, and the word was, take that water outside, pour it in that glass and serve it. Out here it was H2O, out there it was C2H5OH, plus a whole heap of bigger molecules that make purple colours. That's what he did. How long did he take to turn water into wine? Wrong question. Time never turns water into wine. Talent turns water into wine. If you don't believe me, try it. You don't have the talent. You, you, you'll take forever because you won't get there. You see, the problem is you and I think given long enough, things are achieved and the Bible says no way. He um, made loaves and fishes. Well, I went out fishing the other day. I caught a 20 pound salmon, take that. But it didn't have any money in its mouth. No, nothing to pay but taxes. Interesting. And the little boy had five loaves and two fishes. And Jesus said to Peter, <coughs> OK, go and serve them out to all these 5,000 people. Can you imagine that? Five loaves, 5,000. How do I do that? <laughs> You know, Jesus sometimes calls you to believe him and then act and see the results. And they ended up with 12 basketfuls left over, wasn't it? By the way, how long does it take to turn five loaves and two fishes into thousands of meals? Wrong question. Time will never do it. Talent will do it again. Jesus raised the dead and he restored sight to the blind. You see, what's interesting here is when you ask the question, how long did Jesus take? You've missed the whole point. Time never achieves any of those things. What is achieved here is the power of the Word of God. You see, when <coughs> Jesus came to this planet, he uh, certainly did some miracles. But most of us have never noticed one thing. He never could cre took credit for any miracle that he did. He always said, I'm only doing what my Father has given me to do. He humbled himself and became as a man. Wow, you think of the implications that if I obey my Father, what he could do through me. Because what Jesus did was impressive. But then again, he'd already known what it was like to be the Creator. Point number one, before we begin to close off this section and give you a chance to ask questions. This issue is actually about Jesus' power and integrity. <clears throat> if you can turn water into wine, question, how long do you need to make a universe? If you can't make a universe in six billion years because the evolutionist says it isn't finished yet, how long do you take to save a drug addict? Oh, you see, all these issues are actually connected. This issue is about Jesus' power and his integrity, and I'll show it to you in a practical way. Uh, a group of science teachers in New South Wales asked me to take them on a field trip. You see, my background's in lecturing in geology and digging up rocks and fossils all over the planet, and look at one of the fossils I found. Do you see the stem? Do you see the leaves still on it? Do you see the kid who's carrying it? Yeah, I found it, you carry it, kid. Um, yeah, and, and then a bigger kid carried it up the cliff because the cliff was about 30 metres straight up to get back to where we parked our vehicles. I knew what it was, by the way, because this plant is still here. See the stem? See the leaves? This is actually a fossil horsetail rush. It's now in our creation museum. And the reality is, you can prove that horsetail rushes used to be much more impressive. And now they don't even grow in Australia at all. So we had some fabulous finds with this group of science teachers. And we took them to see things like this. See that vertical tree? <coughs> it's called a polystrate tree. I got myself into dickens of trouble talking about these at geological conferences. I've been kicked out of the Association of Geologists for doing this sort of thing. Uh, do you see the layers? Do you see the tree standing up? This is a fossil pine tree. Um, it's vertical. It's embedded in layer after layer after layer. And of course, the ordinary geologist likes to say, this tree grew here, it was buried in the swamp, it was buried slowly, and it took hundreds of thousands of years for all those layers to accumulate. You know, one thing that's interesting, ever since we first found these, um, We've known one thing, these are fossil pine trees. Yeah, easy to recognise, 
And secondly, the, 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 the thing we know, they're standing in coal, but coal is supposed to form in what? Swamps, slowly. And the one place you will never find pine trees growing is in swamps. Particularly Australian southern conifers don't like their feet wet. Something's wrong with this story. In reality, that tree was buried before it fell out. Why do I say that? It's got no roots. How often do you see trees standing vertically with no roots? No, not at all. I wonder how it got there. You see, uh, this trip was organised by those two science teachers. Now the one on the back, <coughs> I've known his father for a long time, his father was an evangelist. The one on the right, I've only met in the past few years. Now his name is Mark, and Mark is interesting because he wants to be involved in what we do and organise trips and, and help us get into schools and things like that. But Mark's got an interesting history. You see, Mark's family went to church when he was a student, but uh, he wasn't all that involved, and there's a good reason for it. I'll get you a bit closer. Can you see his hand on his tree? Can you see layer after layer? Interesting. Mark's had to ponder these trees because the evidence here smacked him in the eyeballs. <clears throat> what do I mean? Well, at Mark's church, they invited a speaker. Now, the speaker was from England, and the speaker said, the scientists have proved the world is so old. Therefore, the days in Genesis, you don't need to worry about them. They cannot be real days. So Genesis 1 must be a poem. It must be a symbol of what was intended. <clears throat> you know, just a simple point, God made everything. That's all you need out of Genesis. <clears throat> you know what's intriguing? Mark listened to that, and as a young science student, I'll tell you how he reacted. Number one, what that speaker is saying is, when I read, and the evening in the morning was the first day, which is easy to read. I don't know any kid who can't read that. And when it says the evening and morning was the first day, the little three-letter word D-A-Y doesn't mean day, because that is what the speaker said. And the speaker from Oxford, very highly qualified, very well respected, probably didn't realise that what was going on in Mark's head was the following. If the three-letter word D-A-Y doesn't mean day, let's go back to Genesis 1. In the beginning, God. Question, if the word D-A-Y doesn't mean day, then does the word G-O-D mean God? You see, you can't chop and change the way you interpret Genesis. If day is not really day, then night is not night. And if night isn't night and God isn't God, then there isn't a single word left in Genesis that actually means anything. Do you know what he did? He said, this is a stupid religion. And he became an atheist. Mark's not an atheist anymore. Do you know why? Because he said, I heard what you guys had found you found actual real evidence that the world, like these rocks here, these layers were formed in less time than that tree took to fall over because it's got no roots. So the rocks don't cry out millions of years, the textbooks do. And if the rocks don't cry them out, I don't need to read Genesis any other way than how it seems to actually mean what it says. And so he became a Christian. Oh, the connection? Um, do you realise when Paul wrote to the church at Corinth, he said, it's not true that Christ rose from the dead of all men. You Christians are most to be pitied. You're deluded. Isn't it true? It doesn't matter if Buddha ever existed. Yeah, it really is irrelevant. All that matters is that Buddha wrote a book. No, not even that matters. All that matters is his philosophy. It doesn't matter if he never existed. How about Confucius? You know, the Analects of Confucius? doesn't matter if there ever was a Chinaman called Confucius. It's his ideas that are important. Question, if Jesus never lived, if Jesus never died, if Jesus never rose from the dead, how important is that? Oh, if it's not true, your faith is absolutely in vain. That was Mark's logic. If Genesis isn't true, then John isn't true, because they both start in the same way, in the beginning. If John isn't true, then Jesus isn't true. And Jesus was foolish if he actually believed in creation because the scientists approved. Oh yeah, there is a connection. Here it is. <clears throat> Jesus himself is recorded as saying, if people do not hear most in the prophets, neither will they be convinced, even if one rise from the dead. Can I give you some advice? That's good logic. That's sound theology. Or oh, Moses, do you know five books that Moses is associated with? 
Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. Anybody name the other parts of the Bible that Moses is associated with? Come on, I'll offer a free DVD. Our subject tonight deals with whether you can actually accept creation as real history. This is my debate against the head of the Faraday Society in England who was trying to argue evolution is true, so therefore God must have used it. And obviously he lost the debate and I won or we wouldn't sell the DVD. Uh, this is yours if you can tell me the other part of the Bible associated with Moses. Yes? No, not Hebrews. Hebrews mentions Moses. Uh, well, now you're going to have to buy it. Uh, the answer is Psalm 90. <clears throat> yeah, Psalm 90. Thank you for listening to A Mighty Fortress. A Mighty Fortress is an Australian confessional Lutheran